and uh, I'm going to go ahead and record that and I'll post that up. And when we get into our chapter 13, what we're really talking about here is financial statement analysis. Okay, now this is really from the standpoint of the individual that is using the financial statements more so than it is from the preparers of the financial statements. But uh, this is a financial accounting class, not managerial accounting. There's still an expectation that as a preparer of the financial statements and the financial accounting, you should understand the nature, the type of analysis that are going to be going on with the financial statements. And so that's why we include that here. Okay. Now, when we look at our um, analysis, we can do uh, liquidity analysis to see if the company had to quickly uh, be able to pay some short-term obligations. Would they have the sufficient resources to be able to pay those short-term obligations? We're going to look at profitability analysis. We're going to uh, understand uh, how the profits are benefiting the stockholders. And we're going to understand solvency. Solvency is more of a longer term focus on the company over time. Are they going to have the sufficient resources to be able to pay their um, long term debtors, uh, long term creditors, that sort of thing? Okay. When we do our analysis, we can do intra company. When we do intra company, we're simply going to be preparing the, comparing the company to itself over time or relative to different financial statement uh, line items. When we do industry averages, we're obviously comparing the company to what? To the overall industry. And when we do intercompany analysis, we're going to com be comparing the results to a specific company that we would choose, maybe a trendsetter or a, a gold standard, a standard setter uh, in the industry. Okay. The tools that we're going to use, we're going to use horizontal and vertical analysis. That's really relevant to intercompany. When we get into these in, um, intra-company, I should say, when we get into intercompany and industry averages, that tends to be where we leverage uh, ratio analysis. And uh, some of this ratio analysis stuff, uh, you already uh, know how to use some of these, particularly some of these profitability ratio analysis that we'll get into. Okay. Okay. So with all that, let's go ahead and let's talk about horizontal analysis. Horizontal analysis means that we will be going horizontally across the financial statements. So is this horizontal? Yeah. Okay. So when we look at the financial statements, we are actually doing something called a longitudinal analysis. I've heard this called. It's really a what? Time analysis where we go and we compare one year to the next. So if you were to draw a line across these financial statements, Horizontally, we're going to be comparing, in this example, 2008 to 2009 to do a horizontal analysis, right? And we're basically saying, seeing, to, looking to see how things have changed over time. So can I please see your calculator that you're going to use to practice this horizontal analysis? If you look on Canvas, you will notice that there are no homework questions for this chapter. That's because we're going to do our homework right here on the slides. We're going to do them right here on the slides. Calculators ready? I mean, by now, you guys should be like the wild, wild west. Just pull out the calculator. <laughs> right? Okay. Ready to do some horizontal analysis? Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. And uh, notice that in 2009, our, let's just do our current assets. We're 1,020,000. Right? And in 2008, they were 945,000, weren't they? Okay, what I'm going to show you right now is how to do the percentage change calculation. Ready? Put into your calculator 1020000. You all got that number in there? Yes. Okay, subtract 945,000 from that. What do you get? You get the 75,000. That's the change, isn't it? Okay. Go ahead and hit equals for that 75,000. You hit equals. 
to fix that in there, and then divide that 75,000 by 945,000 the first year, in this example, 2008. Well, did you get 7.9% roughly? Right? Okay, there, you just did a horizontal analysis, okay? All we're doing is we're figuring out what? We're comparing one year to the next and seeing what the change was between those years, didn't we? Yep. Doing that horizontal analysis. There's no need that someone else has to explain it to you if you had a calculator and you piped the numbers in. Did you have a calculator? No. Yep. Okay. All right, you need to practice with the uh, building up the muscle memory on this. It's, it's not going to do you any good to watch somebody else do it or hear somebody else talk about it. You need to sit here and do it, okay? Okay, you're going to be better off if you do it now. That way you don't have to worry about figuring it out later, okay? All right, so 1,020,000, right? And we're going to subtract from that what? 945000 we had a $75,000 change, didn't we? Okay, and you want to see what percent that change is of the original base year number here, which is 2008, don't you? So if you divide it by the 945000 that's telling you that our current assets grew, what, 7.9% over that one-year period, right? We're good? We're good? No. You take 1,020,000. Go ahead and start over. Take 1,020,000. Got that? Okay. And then subtract 945,000. That gives you 75,000, right? Okay. Then hit the equal sign. And then divide, hit the divide sign and divide that by 1,020,000, ah, by uh, 945,000, I'm sorry, by 945,000. Did I say divide it by 1,020,000? Divide it by 945,000. Well, Let me see. So it might be something in the memory or something. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I'm doing 1,020,000, right? Need one more zero, 1,020,000, and I'm subtracting 945,000 from that. That's giving me a 75,000. Oh, you're saying the number appears? Okay, I don't know why that's happening. Okay, 1,020,000. Minus 945,000 equals 75,000. Maybe you just hit divide now. Hit divide instead of equals. And you divide that by 1 million. Ah, shit. 75,000 divided by 945,000 gives you that number, okay? All right, and the reason I'm having you do this is because I'm going to give you a problem just like this on the final where you're just going to have to sit there and plug in the numbers accordingly. So something like that, okay? Now, this is important because you want to be able to calculate a percentage increase. I promise you that someone's going to ask you to calculate a percentage increase, okay, at some point in time. What was the percentage change from year to year? Percentage increase, percentage decrease, whatever, right? That is a common analysis that happens in business frequently. Uh, I was on an assignment one time, and uh, they wanted me to work with somebody because they couldn't find anybody else uh, that wanted to work with her. So she said, will you work with this person? And we can't find anything for her to do. Nobody wants to put on an assignment. We need to have something for her to do. Can you find something for her to do? I said, yeah, okay, yeah, send her over. I'll figure something out, right? So I sit down, okay, what is it? You know, oh, I'm pretty good at Excel. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I've been asking people to go on to this website and get the uh, financial statements for every housing agency in the country. And everybody just comes back, oh, that's a crazy request. We can't do that. That's impossible. Can you try that? I figure, okay, at least, you know, 
we're trying something and maybe I'll see her again in another couple months, whatever, and I'm keeping her busy, right? She comes back the next day. Got them. All 3,100 housing agencies got them all. Their financial statements in an Excel format. I'm like, no, really? Let me see that. Yes, you do. I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to calculate the percentage increase in these particular, percentage change in these particular line items on the financial statements because I want to see how they've trended over time. She comes back a day later. She says, I can't do it. I said, why? What's wrong? I'm thinking this was the easier task of the two that I've asked. I don't know how to calculate the percentage increase. I'm like, okay, pull out your calculator. Here's year one. Here's year two. Divide it by that year. And she goes, you're kidding, right? That's it? That's all the percentage increase is? I'm like, yeah, that's it. Boom. We start doing all from there. We broke the seal on the whole thing, right? From there, we started doing all kinds of crazy analysis with those things. And we ended up finding out that there were housing agencies that were bouncing checks that had very poor financial indicators, even though the Department of Housing and Urban Development were saying that those housing agencies were amongst the better housing agencies. We were able to show that their system for monitoring them, their control systems, were flawed because they weren't identifying things that we were identifying identify by doing these type of analysis okay so what happens a little while later may um, I'm not supposed to say I'm not saying her name her name wasn't may uh, <laughs> this person and I start when it was in the month of May we start working together they put us on the second assignment third assignment we're killing on all the assignments right then after a while Oh, uh, uh, you can't have me on your assignment anymore. She needs to go and do uh, uh, I'm like great. As soon as she gets good, then everybody wants to pull her away and yank her away to another assignment, whatever, right? Okay, so these sort of analysis guys are common, um, and you uh, will see that they'll be pretty easy questions for in the test. It's pretty easy mechanically, right? But you can learn a lot from these type of analysis for the company. Okay, that is a vertic uh, horizontal analysis. Vertical analysis, we do what? We come down the financial statements to do our analysis. Vertical, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to typically pick a base and then calculate how these line items uh, make up this particular base. So, calculators again, okay, if we're using total assets as our base. We would take, and there's our current assets again, but instead of doing it in a uh, horizontal analysis, we're going to do vertical analysis with it, right? So we're going to take 1,020,000, which is the current assets, 1,020,000, and we're going to divide that by the total assets of 1,835,000. Do you get 55.6? Right? Don't play with your hair too much. I used to have hair like that too, you know, at one point in time. <laughs> no, just kidding. I never had hair like that. I was born bald. Okay, 55.6. Okay. All right, good. Now, you come over and let's do another one. Let's try current liabilities. Current liabilities, 344,500. And we're going to do that as a what? as a percentage of our total liabilities and stockholders' equity, which so happens to also be the amount of our assets, doesn't it? Because that's what assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity, right? But you take what? You take 344500 you divide that by 1835000 Does that give you 18.8%? Why didn't I? Because if I didn't, it wouldn't have come out to 18.8% uh, because this book decided that they would divide it by the total um, liabilities plus stockholders' equity. But if you want to divide it by total liabilities, I got no problem with that. I got no grievance with that. I mean, you can decide to do whatever analysis you want on these things, right? Huh? Well, it is <laughs> Well, it is a different percentage because you used 832,000 as your denominator instead of 1,832,000. And, huh? And I'm just saying to you, 
you know, that might be a reasonable analysis of my liabilities, what amount is current versus non-current, right? Okay, so you could do that analysis too. Yes, sir. Oh, I would ask you, I would say, what percentage does the current liabilities make up of, and I might say total assets, or I might say total stockholders' equity plus uh, liabil liabilities of stockholders' equity. I mean, it'll be very specific. I know it's hard to believe that I would give you something that easy, but that's exactly what it'll be. I'm not going to say, give me the percentage. You know, and you're supposed to know what that means. Okay, so I'll have to be when we're talking about horizontal vertical analysis, um, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. You know, uh, horizontal analysis, I might say something like, what was the percentage change in current assets between 2009 and 2008? And you'd have to know. Okay, I've got to take the difference and then I divide it by the starting year, right, to get the change because we're talking about the change from that year to the next, right? So that you'd have to know. If I say doing a vertical analysis, give me the percentage of current assets of the total assets, right? And, you know, somebody who's somewhere right now saying, I hate that class. I'm going to sit over here by myself in my apartment rather than come to the class. Um, they'll say, what is a vertical analysis, right? Even though it's the easiest problem in the world. Okay. Okay. So that's all you got to do. And the only reason I make you do the calculator, just so you start practicing, just pumping these numbers in. Okay. Question. And I'll probably put a couple, I'll put, I'll put one or two of these on that 15 question exam that we're going to take before. So you get a chance to see some of these in the actual for problem format. Okay. Let's take a look at some of our ratio analysis now. And when we look at our ratio analysis, we're going to have liquidity ratios, profitability ratios, and solvency ratios. You really already know the profitability ratios that we're going to talk about. Okay, You know these ratios already, but we'll revisit them here. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at the liquidity ratios. And we're just looking at the short-term liquidity of the company. If they had to quickly pay off liabilities, would they have the sufficient resources to pay off their more current liabilities? That's all we're looking for here, right? Because what happens? If they can't pay those off, then there's a chance that they're going to fall into a um, you know, bankruptcy situation relatively quickly, right? Okay. So we want to check that out. And so what we'll do is we'll take our current, or we'll have our something called the current ratio, which I think we already studied this, which is going to be current assets divided by what? Current liabilities. Okay. And so this uh, same financial statement that we were looking at before, by the way, we're using this same one. Current assets are what? 1 million, 20,000. Current liabilities are 3, 4, 4, 5. Okay, so we're just going to use those in the calculation. Coming over, there's our current assets. Divide that by what? The current liabilities. And this company has a current ratio of 2.96 to 1. That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, check them out next to industry average. They're even better than J.C. Penny. Oh, my God. J.C. Penny, the retail store of all time, right? Do they even still have J.C. Penny? Do they? I used to go in there when they used to sell A's and Raiders stuff, but I don't think they do anymore. Okay, it's the J.C. Penny's. Okay, so uh, J.C. Penny and Sears used to be great back before you guys were even thought of. Because um, they used to sell like popcorn and candy and stuff inside of J.C. Penny. They had to have these huge counters where you could get all kinds of like good goodies, you know. And I guess parents would just fill their kids up and say, "Go over there, Johnny, and sit by the TV sets and eat some popcorn." And then one time, the Raiders were playing on a playoff game. Have you ever heard of the Maculant Reception? No? It's a, like one of the more famous plays of all football history. And uh, I watched that in the TV section of Sears. 
It's Southland in Hayward. So. <laughs> anyway, okay. So uh, I don't know what to tell you guys. I mean, that's it. If you're waiting for deeper meaning, there's none. Okay. I mean, that's basically how you do these ratios. Okay. Now, look. I do have one comment. Serious comment here. Look, you wouldn't want this number to be a thousand, would you? Okay, shouldn't be this huge, huge number because at some point you start sitting there and saying, hey, you know, quit holding all that cash and invest that cash in those current assets into something that's going to have what? A longer term return for you, right? Okay, but uh, something around three is probably pretty good, you know. Okay, um, our profitability ratios. Oh, no, this is liquidity? Okay, well, where's the profitability ratio? I guess these are all liquidity ratios. Let me see some. Oh, okay. I don't guess I don't have any profitability ratios in here. Okay. Another liquidity ratio. I guess I thought it was kind of a profitability, but yeah. No, I guess this one it, to me is more liquidity. I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with their categorizations of them. I'm not going to test you on the categorization of them, but. I guess this is sort of a liquidity ratio. Anyway, we've already done this, which is what? Receivable turnover. Okay, we want to see how many times they will turn over their receivable in the course of a year. So what do we do? We take the beginning balance of accounts receivable plus the ending balance of account receivable, and we divide that by 2. That goes into the denominator, and then we divide that into what? The credit sales, right? Okay. Now we have that beginning and ending account receivable because we want the average receivable for the year. We want the average receivable for the year. Okay. I suppose you could, if you wanted to come up with a different average that would be close to this one, you could do what? You could take the receivable in December. The receivable in November, October, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, September, October, November, December, January, all 12 months. Divide that by 12, and that would also give you an average, wouldn't it? So it might give you a better measure of the average, but uh, we don't want to put all those numbers in there, do we? So we just use two numbers, the beginning and the ending. We divide by two. That gives me the average receivable, and then I divide that into the net sales. That tells me that I did what? I turned that receivable over 10.2 time, 10 times in, what, 2009 here? Okay. Now, typically, we want to see how long those receivables have been in receivable status. So we will take that 10.2 times and we will divide it by the 365 day year. That means that on average their receivables were what? In receivable status 35.78 days, whatever. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good collection rate for your receivables. I'd say 30, you know, around 30 days is a is pretty good, right? Okay. Now, um, I don't know if I told the story before when we talked about this. Uh, I was on an assignment where they asked us to determine if there were federal agencies that weren't doing a good job collecting their fines and penalties. Can I talk about that? And uh, they wanted us to see, well, you know, find the agencies that don't collect their fines and penalties. So we looked at their financial statements, found their fine and penalty receivable balances, and came up with the um, number of days that they were in receivable status. And then we just ranked them by those that had their receivable status the longest to the shortest period of time. And we just started working our way down the list to understand what was going on with those. And after we got through a few of them, we found three of them that were really having some uh, some issues. Uh, particularly, uh, we were concerned with this uh, agency called the Office of Surface Mining. Their whole job is to make sure that coal miners and people that pull stuff out of the ground clean up the mess after they're done pulling all that stuff out of the ground because it has certain impact on the environment, et cetera. And if you don't do a good job, they fine you. Well, we were seeing that they weren't collecting those fines, and they kept telling us, well, we're just chasing the bad coal miners out of the business, and they don't get into this business anymore. I thought I told you this. And I'm like, huh? Yeah, right? And I'm like, in Pittsburgh, in West, in West uh, Pittsburgh, um, 
and in, in West Virginia, you mean to tell me that these coal miners just leave the business? And it turns out that what they do, as we dug a little deeper, is they go and they start up another coal mining business under another corporate uh, name, and they sit there and they're not liable for those penalties from the old corporation. So we recommended some changes in the law that would make it easier for that agency to pierce the corporate veil, and uh, if they are going to chase them out of business, keep them out of business or get the fines for the uh, cleanup purposes. So anyway, but we found these agencies that were having these problems uh, through this. Customs was another one. Customs problem was... Did I tell you about customs, what they would do? Customs was the other one that we looked at. And customs, the reason they weren't collecting on the receivable is here's what importers would do. Importers would violate the import laws to see what they could get away with. And if they got caught, all they would do is keep the due process going and going and going and drag it up to the point where the due process was going to expire. And if customs didn't come to a resolution, they were going to lose all of the uh, money. And so they would reduce the fine considerably at the 11th hours just so that they would collect something. So from the imp and, and what they would often do is not even find them. They would just simply say, okay, pay us the duties that you would have owed us on the stuff that you tried to sneak in without paying the duties, and we'll call it a day. And our point there was, well, that then motivates the importer to try to get away with it, right? The talk on the street is, hey, you may get away with it, you may not. If you don't, delay the process, and then what? And then, um, you know, you'll just end up paying the, due, the same duties that you would have paid anyway. And so uh, we said, no, you need to be a little tougher. You can't let these things drag on and on and on. You need to start to close that loop on them a lot faster. Um, so that was the recommendation on that. Again, identifying these agencies to begin with started with this days and receivable status. Okay. Okay. So you come over and we talk about our cost of goods sold. Um, I mean our inventory turnover, excuse me. And we had said that inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by what? The average inventory. Okay, so how long does it take you to turn that inventory over? You get that by dividing the average inventory by the cost of goods sold. I mean uh, the average inventory into the cost of goods sold, I should say. Average inventory beginning plus ending divided by two. And this uh, agency, this uh, company turned their inventory over 2.3 times okay now we take that and we divide that by 365 days and that tells us what how long it takes for them to move an item out of their inventory and this is 159 days now you look at that and you know if we're talking about a car dealership okay maybe 159 days is pretty darn good right if we're talking about a sushi restaurant don't eat there right Okay, so it really depends on the industry as to whether or not this is a good or bad days in inventory status. Okay? Okay, good. Solvency ratios, okay? And, huh? The one that we're going to focus on is debt to total assets, okay? And this is basically going to say to you over time, over a period of time, how is this company going to be able to hang in there as their debts start to come due, et cetera, right? Are they going to be able to remain solvent over a longer period of time? So instead of just focusing on current assets and current liabilities, we do what? We include the current and non-current, right? So if they're sitting there and they're in a situation where you know their debt is making up a large portion of their total assets, then over time, that situation is going to start to erode, isn't it? So even though their current ratio maybe will look good, in the long term, if they don't start to generate some more assets, they're going to um, you know, not be solvent over time. Okay, so this is a longer term version of the current ratio, isn't it? Has a longer term time frame than the current ratio does? Okay. Question?
The reason I'm not hitting four, I don't have any other slides, and I'm trying to think of something else to say. <laughs> Heads up, seven up. Oh, yeah, I remember that game. <laughs> Never mind, don't say it, John. Okay. I was just thinking back, but I'm not going to say that. Oh. Okay. Um, I don't really want to get into chapter 13 because it's kind of one of those things that you got to kind of see. I mean, 12, that you have to kind of see like all in one chunk. And if I start it now, I won't finish it now. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> I don't have any for this. On the McGraw Hill? Let's see. Hang on, let me sit down. If I go here, let's see what I find on it. Let's see what Froggy has. Um, No, just the ones we talked about. Okay. Um How can these both be statement and cash flow? They say statement and cash flow is, well, because chapter 13 opened again, even though I clicked on 12. I ain't got it. I don't know. It's around here somewhere, but I don't know where. Let me try this. Oh, I've got an idea. Hang on a second. Okay, let's try number 90 here. Um, a company sales in year one 
were 250,000 and in year two was 287,500 using year one as the base year, what's the percentage change? Percentage change. So what'd you say? Fifteen percent. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. Okay. And we've got what? We've got two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred is the amount that um, came in for year two, right? And we have 250,000 was the amount for year one, right? So we have what? We have an increase of, say it again, 37,500. Okay, good. And then we take that 37,500. And this question was even easier than what I was anticipating it to be. I was thinking I would just ask you the percentage increase or decrease, or right, or percentage change, and you'd have to know to divide by what? What this problem called the base year, 250,000, right? And that gives you 15%? Yeah. Somebody said? Okay. Okay. Uh, Yeats Corporation sales in year one was 396. Sales in 380 a uh, year two, so 396,000 minus what? 380,000 in year two gives me what? 16,000. This is a decrease, isn't it? Okay, so I take that 16,000 and I divide it by what? 396 the base year right year one yeah. so that gives me a percentage decrease of four percent yeah. okay all right let's see if we can find a different kind of one Okay, a corporation reported cash of 14,000 and total assets of 178,300 on its balance sheet, common size percentage for cash. Cash is a percent of what? The assets. I mean, I would probably change that up so that um, it doesn't use some jargon that I don't care if you know about because everybody uses different jargon to, for different things. What am I trying to do here? Lower this keyboard? Okay, and so, uh, but since there's only two numbers with dollar signs next to them in this question, I guess we better use the numbers that are given here if we want to create a percentage that is the ratio between these two numbers, right? Okay, and so we're going to take what? 14,000 and divide it by what? By the total assets. So cash is a percentage of their total assets constitutes what? 7.85. Okay. Um, we didn't get into this. Um, well, we didn't call it working capital. 
okay we did current ratio okay but working capital is the difference between my current assets and my current liabilities and so I have a difference here of what 56,000 it's got to be 56,000 is the difference between these that 56,000 is something called working capital By working capital, we mean, hey, this is money you can play with. You can find some sort of activity, some sort of an investment for this company that you can roll this cash up in, and you'll be okay because you'll have enough money to pay your current liabilities, and you can roll this cash around into something like, I don't know, maybe a, a productive asset that requires a deposit of $8,000. You can get into that project because you've got a little bit of money laying around that you can put into that project that requires a deposit for the machinery or something that you're going to use for that of $8,000. You can tie up that working capital for a little while, right? That's called working capital. And we can turn this into a ratio if we want. If we want to call it a working capital ratio, we could take 56000 and divide it by, what, one hundred and ninety three thousand that gives me working capital ratio of what is it one of these numbers no okay it doesn't matter what is it because the answer here is fifty six thousand what is that working capital ratio fifty huh twenty nine percent okay so you can turn it into a ratio as well if you want to okay I want to ask you that one Okay, uh, how about the current ratio? You did it that fast? 1.4 to 1? So it's what? It's 193,000 divided by what? 137,000 gives me, what would you say, 1.4 to 1? Okay. There's something called the acid test ratio. Okay. Acid test ratio is a little bit more critical measure of my solvency. And when we do the acid test ratio, we typically leave out our inventory out of the analysis because inventory could be something that's difficult to move in particular if we have a funky product right okay or a product that maybe is starting to uh, experience some obsolescence whatever so when you do the acid test ratio we're still going to have the uh, current liabilities in the denominator but now we cherry pick the best assets, those that we think are going to, you know, be that are fairly liquid. For example, we would pick up the 62,000 of cash. We would pick up the 43,000 of accounts receivable. Not the inventory. We leave the inventory out because inventory is not necessarily that fast moving of a asset if we're in a situation where, you know, we're uh, experiencing some difficulty to sell that inventory. So that gives us now what? Um, 107,000? 105,000? 105,000 divided by the 137. That gives me what? 0.771. Okay. Okay. Nah, I'm just going to ask you the ones on those slides, unless you guys insist. I just asked because it was mentioned that it wasn't given memory slides. I know. And I'm just saying, no, unless you insist. If you want it, I can do it. As you see, I have how many pages are in this file? I have 208 pages of questions that I can give you. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, how about the accounts receivable turnover ratio? They tell me that what? Net sales were 1,200,000. And I'm going to divide that by what? The average receivable, which they just gave it to me. They didn't make me calculate it. Well, you know, they figure if you've come this far, you know what you're doing, right? So 78,500, what's that give me? 15.3. Okay, good. And then uh, how about uh, the days in receivable status? I'm going to take, what, 365 and divide it by 15.3? Pretty good. Okay. Is there any need to continue this? Okay. So it's going to be, it's going to be stuff like that, guys. It is very straightforward, and I'm not one that is particularly fond of pouring ratio after ratio after ratio on you because, you know, the day on uh, December 12th, you will forget every single one of these ratios and how to do them until somebody once again says, can you do the ratio? And you're going to say, hmm, how do I do them ratios? And you're going to look them up somewhere and do them, right? Okay. Okay, guys. I'll see you on uh, Monday, Chapter 12. Be ready for a full discussion, guys. Chapter 12 is something that gets a little bit hard to figure out on your own, I promise you. And then uh, we'll uh, do the homework for that on Wednesday, and then we'll get ready for the final the following Monday. Okay, guys. Hi. Uh, if you want to hang on a minute, I can take a look. Uh, let me stop the recording first. Uh.